Hey folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 105, The Devil is Dead. We're going to continue with the memo written by the TAC unit as to what they did and what their responsibilities were during the siege. There'll be some interesting things come up in this episode and that last episode which we'll do in a week or so that is really going to be entertaining all right folks let's jump right into it all right bottom of the page after the microphones were in place the results seemed to be productive as there were sounds and some movement from within the house noted and some statements recorded of a voice later determined to be Lindbergh Sanders. To the effect, my brother's dead, my father's dead, and the devil's dead. Other sounds were heard which were duly recorded either by the TAC unit and or the hostage negotiation team and our own file and have been examined. Should be noted at this point, the TAC command did disagree with the hostage negotiation techniques employed by some of their negotiators. TAC commanders felt that perhaps the negotiators were a little too aggressive, not allowing Sanders to speak when hours had been waited for any sound. Captain Music met with Inspector Don Lewis to discuss the techniques used in the negotiations. And folks, if you remember when you were listening to some of the earlier episodes, the issue came up then about the TAC unit telling negotiators to, you're talking too much, you're not giving... Sanders, anyone in the house, a chance to to respond to what you're saying. All right, continuing on. Cat Music was summoned to the command post shortly after 2 a.m. Thursday, January 13, 1983, for a staff meeting. This meeting included staff of the Memphis Police Department, along with the administrative staff, City Hall and other elected officials. Well, folks, that right there tells you right off the bat this is a cluster. It's just almost mind-boggling that we're going to have a meeting to discuss a tactical police situation, and we're going to include administrative staff and City Hall and other elected officials. Now, y'all just think about that for a second and let that sink in on how absolutely asinine that is and what a joke that is. And then you wonder why Bobby Hester was left to die. It was discussed as to where the situation was. That shouldn't have taken too long. What else could be done? How about we go in? And how much longer could be waited and have any expectation that Patrolman Hester would survive? Well, I would say not too long. The staff of the Memphis Police Department was in total agreement to assault. Director Holt then held a short, brief meeting with the mayor and his staff and the elected officials informing them of of our decision. Now that's interesting that uh, Director Holt then has to have a little private meeting with the mayor and the uh, other politicians about a police matter. The alarm bell should be going off in your head. The situation was turned over to the TAC unit shortly thereafter. Well, that's nice. Only about 30 hours too late. The plan was that Deputy Director A.L. Williams would have uniformed personnel to completely evacuate the south side of Shannon Elementary School and inform Captain Music, who had returned to the TAC command post. The area was clear. Deputy Director Williams gave the signal at approximately 3 to 3.05 a.m. 
Captain Music then informed the team leader, Sergeant Huff, and the assault team leader, Patrolman McNair, to begin the assault. Some positions had been in place the entire situation and others made for tactical reasons during the siege. The following describes the personnel and placement. Sniper positions on the roof of Shannon Elementary School were Patrolman M.J. Bailey, boat and scope man, armed with a 308 caliber rifle, V.R. Melton, with a 223 caliber rifle, E.L. Lancaster with a 223 caliber rifle, and J.W. Jeter armed with a 223 bolt scope rifle. Also on the roof was Patrolman Cheslock and J. Thurman, both men utilized as cover men armed with M16 rifles. East side of 2239 Shannon were Patrolman M.E. Bibbs, R.J. Shelton, P.E. Long, and F.E. Bartlett assigned security around the house during the assault. They also were assigned to administer ordnance prior to the assault, five ferret rounds, one artillery simulator, and one C.S. canister was deployed by each officer. These officers were armed with 870 Remington shotguns. Sniper positions south of 2239 Shannon were Patrolman York, McWilliams, and Jones, located in a vacant duplex directly south of 2239 Shannon. All these men were armed with 223 caliber bolt and scope rifles. On the west side of 2239 Shannon were Patrolman R.T. Easley, J.N. Philsinger, and P.E. Hale. These men had the same assignment as those positions mentioned on the east side. They deployed gas and artillery simulators, all armed with shotguns. Sergeant Fields, Bland, and Huff were assigned as inter-perimeter team leaders stationed front and back of 2239 Shannon. Their capacity was to include logistical help to the assault team in the form of manpower and or equipment, and most importantly, to ensure immediate medical attention to not only Patrolman Hester, but any assault team member who required aid. Dr. Milner, Staff Reserve, was positioned in a secure area with a TAC officer to be brought forward immediately on Officer Hester's rescue. These sergeants, Fields, Huff, and Bland were also not only to initiate the assault, but to guide and direct any emergency equipment brought in as paramedics were a short distance away. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode. We'll finish up the TAC memo here in a few days. And then we'll probably take a couple of minutes at the end of uh, that memo and probably do a little review about what the TAC unit's actually saying in this memo. Seems pretty clear without coming out and saying it. But anyways, I think it's uh, pretty obvious from what we've read so far or what the problem was. All right, folks, I appreciate y'all. Thanks for listening in. And as always, I'll see you down the road.